Amen. I'm so sorry about that. Yes, it was. Amen. Praise the Lord, Senior Bishop. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes, I can hear you. I'm Amen. back now. I'm so sorry. Yes, it's my network that was bad. Okay. So what, I, what I was saying is, I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, we can. Mm. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. So what I was saying is that um, the five love languages are tightly related to our expectations. So I was saying when you zoom out and you look at the totality thereof uh, and uh, of, of the five love languages, you realize that uh, to understand them well, you need to understand expectations, how we arrive there. How do we get to the five love languages? We arrive there because of our expectations, expectations that have been shaped by our family background, that have been shaped by our education, that have been shaped by our social status, that have been shaped by our friends and, uh, and, and circles, that have been shaped by our life experiences, that have been shaped by, of course, the social media and television programs, yeah? shaped by things that we have read, yeah, what we read and hear, apart from social media, a lot of things. And, and most importantly, our spirituality, our spiritual background. Yeah, all these things, uh, our relationship with God, all these things shape uh, our expectations, they give us a certain perspective on what to expect, what to seek for out of marriage, what to want out of marriage. Um, and, and that's why you find the scripture say uh, not to be unequally yoked, because when you are unequally yoked, meaning you have two different expectations, you have two different uh, goals for your marriage, for your marriage, for your relationship. And so the, 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 the family background, this is one of the biggest one, one of the heavy um, influences and our spiritual, our spiritual background. Of course, a host of things, life expect, experiences, but especially here, our spiritual backgrounds and our family background, where you grew up. Somebody said, if you look at your spouse, your husband, your wife, uh, you look at them carefully and you look at their parents, then you know what to expect. <laughs> Amen. If you look, if you look at their spouse, at their, at their parents, their, their, especially the, the girls, you look, you look at the, the, for the ladies, you look at their, their mothers, for the men, you look at their fathers, the way they treated their spouses. That is how uh, your spouse will also be behaving in, 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 in your relationship. And, and that is to be expected because we spent nearly 18 years, if not more, at least 18 years under the roof of our parents. And so we receive so much from our parents. Okay. Uh, Shangela is asking a question about... Um, uh, and I was explaining Matthew 5.32. What did you mean? Okay, when he said accepts sexual immorality. Okay, we can, we can handle that uh, later. All right. Um, I was reading a message in the chat box there, posted by Shangelao. So let, let, let me get back to expectations. So I was saying our family background has so much uh, to teach us. In fact, even yourself, when you look at the way you behave, the way you reason, the way you think. If you look back at your parents, you'll find that they have had such a significant impact on your, on your life, and rightfully so. 
Yeah, rightfully so. And some of the things that we learn from our parents are not necessarily bad. Yeah, we learn we learn a lot of good things from our parents, except some of our parents indeed they have uh, given us very ungodly ex- examples. And if you are not careful, even those examples will end up uh, exhibiting them in our marriages, in our relationships. So we should be careful. So 18 years we spent under their roof. Uh, in a, as much as our old children are spending under our time under our roofs, and we are doing our best to instill in them certain values, to instill in them certain ways of thinking and ways of behavior. And so these behaviors we are instilling in them, as our parents have instilled behaviors and ways of thinking in us, they will remain with us for a long time. Uh, Proverbs say, teach a way, train a child in the way he should go, and he shall not depart from it. And so that really shapes a lot of expectations. Uh, and these expectations range from, um, okay, before we get into the, the, the types of ex- expectations, um, there, are, there are two kinds of expectations. We have, we have realistic expectations. And then we have unrealistic expectations. Yeah, And then you can say, of course, uh, when, when it comes to the spiritual life, you can have um, godly expectations. And you can also have ungodly expectations, sinful expectations. Yeah, uh, And then you can then, um, mm-hmm, realistic and unrealistic. Good. Realistic expectation meaning it is achievable. Yeah. Uh, it's realistic. It is consistent with uh, uh, with life. With 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 it brings into 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 view different angles. For example, like to have an expectation such as uh, every every week we should go and eat out at the restaurant. Yeah, an expectation like that may not necessarily be realistic, yeah? especially if uh, you don't earn a host of money. Even if you earn a host of money, it may, it may be an unrealistic expectation to expect to be going out with your spouse to a restaurant every single month and spend a certain amount of money on food. So that may, that may be realistic uh, or expectation of to be faithful, to be faithful, uh, as, as couples, that is a realistic expectation. Yeah? Uh, an expectation to visit my parents or visit our parents at least once a year, that may be realistic. An unrealistic expectation may be uh, something like um, every time I come home, there must always be food for me to eat. It doesn't matter what time of the day I come home. There must be hot meal for me to eat. As a, as a man now, you are demanding from your spouse. That may not be realistic. That, that, that definitely is not realistic. Be expecting your wife. Every time you come home, there must be a hot meal or, or whatever, breakfast in bed or other expectations. Really, you can, you can uh, brainstorm and come up with a lot of uh, unrealistic expectations. Godly expectations, of course, these are ones that conform to the way of the Christian life, yeah? that conform to uh, Christianity, holiness, righteousness. Um, and then uh, ungodly expectations, these are now the expectation of the worldly people in the sense that um, uh, doing things that do not conform to the ways of Christ. Um, now, I wanted to say that, um, so we can, we can name some of these expectations. Uh, some, of, some expectations can be, <clears throat> uh, let's see, when to have children. Yeah, that's an expectation to have children. And, well, methods of, of contraception, that's also an expectation. There can also be expectation tied to that. Um, where, where to live, where we are going to live, that's also an expectation. Um, how much money to make. Um, you can really add a lot of things to this list. Uh, whether whether your spouse whether your your spouse will work 
or not. Yeah, As a, uh, some men they don't want their their wives to work at all. Uh, they just want their wives to be at home. Uh, they just want their wives to be at home, and not and not work. They want to be the ones who are working. And then uh, we have um, other expectations. Yeah, what lifestyle? What lifestyle to to uphold? You want to live uh, as the as the rich people to, to to try and emulate the lifestyle of of rich people, or you want to live a humble uh, a humble life, a humble life that uh, uh, that is not that does not flaunt and try to show off to the people, even in the church. Yeah, and so many expectations can be added there. So. And, and, and any of these then, you can look at them and see whether they are realistic or unrealistic, whether they conform to Christian ideals or they don't. And, and then based on your expectations, these expectations, it is our expectations that shape our perception of what an ideal husband and an ideal wife looks like. Amen? So based on the expectation that we have received, that has been shaped by our background, by people we hang out with, as the scripture says, corrupt company, eh? wrong company corrupts good manners. All these, all these influences that shape our expectations, these then give us a picture. It gives you a picture of what is the ideal husband? What is the ideal woman, ideal wife that I should be looking for? And now you find yourself in that marriage based on those expectations that, uh, that when you were getting married, you said, I want to get married to a man who is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the man says, I want, uh, a woman says, I want a man who is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Those are expectations uh, that, that give you that picture that this man, the man, my husband must be like this. My wife must be like that. And, and so these then shape, they shape then how you want to feel loved by this person, how you want to feel loved by that person, by this man or by this woman. And also your, the expectation of how, what, what you think, how you think uh, uh, is the right way for you to show your love to this person. Amen. Does that make sense to somebody? Does this make some sense to somebody? Is everybody able to hear me? Yes, bless Bishop. Amen, great. Uh, I was hoping I did not lose connection again. All right. And then yes. now, yes, thank you so much. So then that brings me now to this. That brings us now to the, okay, my network is cutting. Okay, but it's back now. So this is then what brings us to the five love languages. So we have all these expectations. And in your expectation as a woman, you feel like if my husband really loves me, he must spend time with me at home at least one hour a day or whatever. If my wife really loves me, every time I come back from home, she must meet me at the, at the door <laughs> and open the door for me. If my wife really loves me, you know, all these things. Yeah. And so, so we have quality time. We have physical touch, we have um, acts of service, we have gifts, receiving gifts, and we have words of, of affirmation. Amen. So let us start with our quality time. Amen. So let's start with quality time. Before that, there's another point I need to make before I start with quality time. There's another point I need to make that. When our love, our, our expectations, or the love languages, um, the love languages, there's one thing we need to understand about love languages, that even though there is, a, each one of us now has to, the, the, has to identify which one is my love language that makes me feel loved by my spouse, so that then your spouse will be aware of it, so that they know how to treat you in a way that makes you feel loved. 
uh, we have to remember that the love languages must all be practiced. The love languages, there is, or should I say, there is no marriage, there is no marriage that can <laughs> survive or thrive without a proper balance of the five love languages. Amen? So you have to, to, to find a proper balance to ensure that, number one, you spend quality time, that there is appropriate physical touch in your marriage, that there is acts of service in your marriage, that there is receiving and giving of gifts in your marriage, and that there is appropriate words of affirmation in your marriage. If your marriage does not have quality time, then it's like living as roommates in your house. <laughs> yeah, if you don't have quality time with your spouse, that's terrible. If you don't have physical touch with your spouse, that is horrible. <laughs> yeah. If you don't have, uh, if you don't do acts of service for your spouse, you don't wash dishes, you don't uh, clean the toilets, you don't wash nappies, then something is wrong with you. <laughs> you're, you're not doing anything for your spouse. Yeah. If you are not uh, saying words of affirmation, good, kind words to your spouse, words of encouragement, words of love to your spouse, then something is terribly wrong. If, if anything, if, if there is a problem with the five love languages, then that means there is a problem with communication in, in that marriage. Amen. So these are all undergraded, undergraded, undergraded by communication. It is communication that allows us to properly, uh, allows us to properly have a good balance of quality time, of physical touch, acts of service, gifts, giving and receiving, and words of affirmation in our marriages. Without communication, everything else falls apart. So there is this underlying thread, this silver lining that holds everything together, that allows us to have, to communicate our expectations, our love languages, yeah? So we have to communicate our love languages. We have to communicate with our spouses. We have to learn to discover our love languages. Once you discover your love language, and then your spouse must also learn to discover their love language. And then you must learn to communicate your love language in a very humble and kind way and loving way so that both of you are now aware of how to love each other better. Amen. So some people's love language, primary love language. So they say that, uh, and, and we all have all these love languages, but then in, in, in a certain order. Sometimes love, some, for some people, quality time means more. And then any other combination. And then other combinations can fall under that. Maybe quality time first, and then acts of service second. And then uh, you could care less whether you get gifts or not, although they are still good to receive. Yeah. So, so, so at the end of our, of our discussion or throughout our discussion, it is, it will, you, you'll then be encouraged to identify what is your love language um, and um, what is your spouse's love language so that you know how to, uh, so that you, you, you know how to love your spouse better. I think, I think uh, out of my, um, is it prejudice? No, not prejudice. I think exp uh, um, out of my uh, observation, I think there are certain love languages that are uh, mostly pertaining to women, that women mostly have these certain uh, love languages. And then there are those that are mostly uh, pertain to men, that men have more these as their primary love languages. I will say it, I will, I will indicate here which ones. I think quality time and that's one, yeah? And um, gifts giving, I think quality time, gifts receiving, receiving gifts. And which other one is that one? And uh, words of affirmation. I think most women, these are their primary love languages. Yeah, that's, that's my personal uh, view. 
and and for most men, most of their primary love languages, you would have um, physical touch. <laughs> That's not how we write physical touch. Physical touch and acts of service and what's the other one? Uh, acts of service, physical touch, and words of affirmation. Yes. I words of affirmation is already there. Yes, and words of affirmation. I think these most men have these as their love languages. That when you say nice, nice things to them, oh, they could, uh, they feel so loved by their wives. Physical touch, most men, this is their primary one, physical touch, acts of service. So you find a lot of men, they say, they, they want to marry a, a woman who can do so many things for them, cook for them, do laundry for them, and all these things, because their love language is acts of service. And uh, most women, quality time, uh, you find them, they, they just want their husband to spend even just one hour at home, gifts giving, receiving gifts uh, on birthday, which one is that? Anniversary and all these things and words of affirmation. So I think most women, these are their primary love languages and you cannot really go wrong if uh, you try to implement either of those. However, each one of us are very peculiar. We are very peculiar beings. Uh, and uh, we have uh, our own um, um, nuances that our spouses have to be uh, aware of. So quality time. So quality time has to do with um, spending time with, with spouses, spending time together. And uh, I'm a believer in the fact that quality time is quantity time. Quantity time. What does that mean? Meaning, spending, even though spending 30 minutes together a day is good, one hour would even be better, or two hours would be better, <laughs> as is possible. That quality time is quantity time. That uh, trying to spend the, the least amount of time with your spouse re really will not be beneficial for your marriage. This is especially goes for the gentleman. You know, before before marriage, when we're in the courtship stage, preparing for marriage, we have a lot of uh, expectations, yeah? We can't wait to be together. We can't wait to, to start our family. And you can almost do anything. You can almost fly across the ocean. You can leave your job for five days. You don't care whether you are fired or not. <laughs> Sometimes we care, yeah? But you, you are ready to do anything. If it means flying to the USA with your last money in the bank account, you are willing to do that to secure this relationship. If, uh, uh, if it means um, what going to see the parents uh, for, 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 for a week or whatever, you are willing to do that to ensure that this relationship succeeds and you finally marry the love of your life. So you, 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 we are in this chase. Yeah? We have this chase to make sure that we secure our future together. But then tragedy strikes. <laughs> when we get married, you find the chase, the thrill of the novelty just wanes off. And for the men now, you feel like you don't have to perform anymore to chase your, 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 your wife to get to know her more so that she can be uh, endeared and attracted to you. And so most men, they become so relaxed, uh, reluctant and can easily spend time outside of the house than, uh, than to spend time at home. And especially when you now bring in the element of conflict in the house, then you find that some people, they would rather spend time with their friends. Some men, and even women, they would rather, rather spend time with their friends, wherever, in church. Some, some would even rather go and, uh, and spend time with their brothers uh, from church rather than to go home and be with their spouses. Uh, and sort out their issues and just spend time together. Yeah, quality time. We need to spend quality time, meaning as much time as possible together. To, to do what? Quality time for what? To just sit and look each other in the eyes? <laughs> sometimes, 
Sometimes that will do. Yeah. Sometimes just being at home will do. It's better than being away. <laughs> but, but not just to sit on the couch as long as you're at home. Uh, because if you're at home and you're watching TV, or you're at home and you're you are, you are indulging in other things and your spouse cannot even communicate with you, then uh, what are you doing at home? Then the, the, there is no progress there. The marriage is not being nourished. The marriage is not, your relationship is not being built. So uh, need to be at home, be at home, or go somewhere, or, or go somewhere with your spouse. This is especially for the gentlemen, for the brothers. We need to learn to, do we have many brothers here? Ah, yeah. Okay, Pastor Jeva is here. So this is especially for the brothers. You need to learn to be at home and you need to learn to uh, make time for your wife and spend time alone. Now, if there are children, there are ideas of uh, uh, sometimes asking your neighbors or your, or, your, or, your, or your friends or your sisters, relatives, to take care of the children while you take time off. For busy couples, it is said that um, after work, to make it a point, that when you come back home from work, at least spend 30 or one hour together as a couple and catch up, catch up on the day. Yeah? Talk and catch up on the day. In our busy world today, uh, you wake up at 6.30 a.m. to go to work that starts at 7.30 a.m. And in that, that one hour before you leave home, after waking up, you don't really have time to discuss with your spouse. You don't really have time to sit down and say, oh, so how was your dream last night? <laughs> yeah, or what are you planning to do today? You just wake up, brush your teeth, shower, eat breakfast, drink your glass of juice, and then start the car and go. And uh, if, if you are some people that work until 5 p.m., on your way from work from 5 p.m. to 6 or 7 p.m., you are in this traffic jam. If you are in big cities, if you are in a big city, may I, may I use the internet? If you are in a big city like, uh, like, like uh, is it München? Where are you over there, Senior Pastor Jacqueline? Is it Munich? I'm in Frankfurt. <laughs> yes, Frankfurt. Big, big city there, like, like Moscow. Big city, you may even spend two hours on the traffic, in traffic, just going slowly like this. By the time you get home, it's already sunset. You are tired from the driving. You have barely recovered from the stress of the work. <laughs> and you're already thinking tomorrow, 6 a.m., I must wake up. It's already 10 p.m., you have not yet eaten, you have not yet refreshed. And so there is this, um, this, this um, cycle of busyness, yeah? And we need to learn to calm down and, and be deliberate. And be deliberate in our making, in our, in our time, in, in spending quality time together. Yes, that's there. Be deliberate, deliberate and purposeful to make time for each other. For example, so after work, you come home, you eat, and then you have your one hour or so together. Yeah? Come back home, eat, and spend uninterrupted time together. Hallelujah. Spend uninterrupted time together. Some people say even five minutes, but I think five minutes is really cheating. <laughs> some say even if it's just five minutes talking before you go to bed I think five minutes is, is really cheating try at least 30 minutes to an hour hallelujah we have to make time for our spouses at least 30 minutes to an hour but uninterrupted meaning our intrusive phones and our intrusive computers have to be off or packed away for some time so that we can truly focus and listen to our spouses. You know, when the day goes by, there are so many things that happen and that your spouse would want to offload. As human beings, we, always, we all need somebody to talk to. 
somebody to talk to, somebody to confide in, somebody to listen to us. We all need somebody to listen and just listen and not solve the problem, just listen, just to listen. Oh, is my screen off? Is my screen still off, uh, Pastor Jacqueline? No, yes, it's off. It's off. I can see you, but yes, please. Okay, for oh. okay, let me try again. Mm -hmm. How about now? Yeah, you are visible, but your screen is off for, for a while now. Mm -hmm. It's off, still off. Is it still off? Oh, can I can I use your phone? Just loading for me. Is the internet good then? Yes, your screen is fine, Senior Blessed Bishop. Is it on now for you, Sister Abby? Yes, it's on. It's okay. been on. So you can see quality time, everything I'm, I wrote here. Can you see? Can you see the document, the one note document I'm sharing? I know what. Can, can you this see? Screen is off. <laughs> it's it's off. off. Really? Mm. Oh, my apologies. I thought you meant your home screen, not the screen you were sharing. My apologies. Yes, it's off, Sina Blessed Bishop. Let me try a different How about now? Praise the Lord. How about now? No, just just till you. Still not? Okay, let me try again. It's a very good question. Now? It says you're sharing your screen. So it's loading, let's just see never show. But you can hear my voice, right? Yes, that's the senior bishop, but you're low, your volume switched. My volume, okay, but it's better now. Yes, yes. Okay, great. All right. Uh, okay, but you can hear me so good. Let me, let me, uh, the, while the screen is loading, uh, so we continue talking. All right. So, what I was saying, um, there's a good question there by Pastor Gael. <clears throat> How to manage quality time? Yes. As a pastor having responsibilities in the ministry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very true. Now, remember I said here, remember I said, you have to be deliberate and you have to be purposeful. You cannot allow, uh, you cannot leave anything to chance. Yeah? We cannot leave anything to chance on the back burner and let, think, let, uh, let chance have its way so that uh, if we have time, then we have time. If we don't have time, then we don't have time. <clears throat> no. Part of quality time, as, uh, as, we, as we sift our way through this, part of quality time is, here's the thing, to ask yourself, are you willing this is a question to give to, to ask yourself now. Yeah? Are you willing to, if it comes to that, if it comes to that, to give up your job for your family or for your wife or husband? Amen. That's a very, very important question to ask yourself. Will you be willing? If it comes to that, yes, Senior Bishop, to give up your job for your wife, husband, or family, <laughs> you hear you hear a lot of people regretting today. Uh, let me just use the, this recent one. This recent one in the news. I'm sure most of us have heard of it. 
uh, Bill Gates and his wife that are divorcing. Uh, somebody asked him, if you could do anything differently, what would it be? Do you know what he said? No. That, of course, to appreciate his wife more, to be with his wife, to spend some time with the wife. She complains that uh, he didn't really help her with the kids at home. <laughs> they, have, they have three children. He complains, she complains, they've been together for about 27 years. She's complaining that he didn't spend much time to help at home. We have to be deliberate. We have to be purposeful. You have to, you have to, 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 to take the bull by its own and, and change your mind and change your focus, change your perception and plan that I must have time for family, for my wife, for my husband. So that means we have to set our priorities right. Set our priorities right. Yes, Pastor Jacqueline. Uh, yeah, I would also like to add on that topic, the question of uh, Pastor Gael, mm -hmm. that uh, we were told that, you see, your, your, your marriage, your family is your first ministry. Yes. So before you go to the church to minister, you mm -hmm. must have ministered first in your house. Definitely, you yes. So if you have a husband who is crying, ah, she doesn't have time for me. In the mm -hmm. night, she's praying. In the morning, yes. she's busy going to church. She's yes. busy on phone calling other people, but she doesn't call me. That one is also, she doesn't have time to, to spend with the husband, you see? Yes. That one is already a failure in your, for you as a pastor. Definitely. So yes. The first thing is to care for your family. So sometimes, mm -hmm. like you say, you have to be deliberate. You have to mm -hmm. re really let go of other things, switch off the phone, switch off whatever, switch the world out of you mm -hmm. and concentrate in your marriage, in your home. Definitely. Because you are the mother, you are the one to care for your husband, you are the one to care for your home and your children, you see? Yes. So yeah. you are busy caring for other people's children in the church while your children don't have your time. It is really uh, something that is not in order. So we have to learn to shut the world out, to shut other responsibility out, our jobs, mm -hmm. our whatever we have, mm -hmm. and concentrate in the very first thing that the Lord has given us. That is our marriage first. Hallelujah. Amen. Could... That is what I can add there. Mm. That is very powerful. Pastor, Pastor um, Jacqueline. I could not have said it better. Shut other responsibilities out and concentrate on your family. And, and that's to ask yourself a question. Is your, is your husband or your wife a priority to you? Is he or she more important uh, than your job? Uh, as, and as Pastor Jacqueline said there, that um, you have to, to remember that your family is your first ministry. That's why when the Bible calls the pastors, calls for the overseers, he says one of the qualifications there is one who can manage his house well, one who can take care of his family well. So if you cannot take care of your family, then which, fam which house of God are you going to take care of? Amen. Um, and, 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 we, and we will live to regret it if we don't make time for our spouses, our husbands. Another man, uh, another very famous worship leader, um, I was watching a video. He's lamenting. Up to now, he's lamenting that, you know, when he first started off in ministry, he was doing ministry, yeah? Ministering down to the Lord, going to conferences and worshiping here and there, running around, but no time for the family. He has time for everybody else, but not for his house. Until the wife said, now, not that we, yeah, of course, not, not that we are supporting this, but this is just the consequence of what has happened. And we are just focusing on what happened uh, and how to avoid such uh, calamities in our own marriages. The wife got fed up and said, I'm not valued in this relationship, in this marriage. And she filed for divorce because the husband was never at home. Yeah, not that we're supporting divorces here, but we're just saying that. Quality time is very, very important. We have to make time for our families, for our, house, for our, for our spouses, for our husbands and, and, and our wives. If you find yourself saying that I don't have time, it's a big question mark. That's a very, very big question mark. Yeah. 
in fact, a red flag. Red flag. Turn back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Yeah. You don't have time for your spouse. That is a very, very big red flag. So you have to set your priorities right. Are you willing to give up your job? In fact, you must be willing to give up your job if it means spending time with your family. You must. Hallelujah. Quality time. Be deliberate. Be purposeful. Don't leave anything to chance. And don't say, well, uh, the Lord will help me. The Lord would really help you, but that's why the Lord has given you a brain or something. And me. The Lord has given us the brain to think and to realize that we need to prioritize. We need to prioritize our marriages. And so I said, uh, at least on a daily basis, uh, because you see, mornings are very busy. Afternoons, not all of us work close to home or work at home or work from home. And so we have to, especially in the evening there when you come back from home. And you also must learn to, to structure your, what, your, your, your leave days. <laughs> leave days well. Plan your leave days well so that you can spend time with, that, uh, with your family. Yeah. When, uh, when we're having our son, this is one lesson I had learned before we got married that uh, I must be willing and ready to give up my job if it means putting my family first. And so when, uh, when, uh, when we're having our son this year, January, and we had decided that uh, he would be born in, in the UK, um, and I was working, and my wife was going to go to the UK, I had to make a choice. And I was willing to make that choice. And I was excited to make that choice, to give up my job so that I could go and be with my wife, to help her, to be with her during those first very important months of a newborn, of having a newborn baby, where there is so much uh, stress and so much help is needed. So as you make your priority, as you set your priorities right, as you put your family first, as you make time for your spouse, you must do it joyfully. You must do it willingly and not grudgingly. If you are trying to make time for your husband, and yet you are, you, are, you, are, you are murmuring, you are saying you could have spent your time better with your friends. You could have spent your time better at so-and-so's house. You are just shooting yourself in the foot <laughs> because that quality time is not going to be valuable at all. It's not going to achieve much if you are going there with a the, the begrudging heart. And it's always good um, to, to have your heart in it and say, I want to do this. I'm willing to do this because I understand the importance. Because the more you spend time together as a family, the more you spend time together as a couple, the more you build your intimacy, the more you grow your communication, the more you get to know one another. How are you going to get to know one another if you don't spend time together? Yeah, you will not know one another if you don't spend time together. If all the time you're at work or you're doing this or doing that and you're not spending time to discuss, share ideas, uh, share scriptures, read together, whatever you're going to do, pray together, discuss, you know, share, uh, communicate, communicate and more communication and more communication. If you don't have time for that, then you're not going to grow. You're going to stunt your growth. You will feel like we've been together for 10 years, but we still don't know one another. That's how people... Uh, end up, end up, end up uh, destroying their marriages. Ten years together and they still don't know one another because they don't spend time together. Yeah, they don't spend time together. So, uh, is there anything else we should add to this? Any anything somebody would like to add to this before we move on to another yes. Uh, topic? Yes, please. That was uh, who's that? Yes. yes, I wanted to add. Uh -huh. Yes. When yes. comes to the, when comes to to, to marriage as a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, you need to take care of your family first. Yes. Otherwise, you will be destroying the congregation of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because I remember those days. I, I normally look at the pastor and his wife. <laughs> I always want to, to know how, how is their lifestyle, how are they growing up, their kids, how they are doing things, because I was always checking on them. Yes. 
And then now you are a pastor and your wife is always murmuring, is always complaining, or your husband, then people out there, you are you are destroying them already. And then sometimes people may come with, a, uh, with the same situation to you. How will you advise them? That is the thing now. You won't be able to help them. You can't help yourself. Yes. Yes. That's very true. Yes, that's very true. People are reading. People are looking. Our marriages must be an example, especially for us as Christians, must be very, very exemplary uh, to the world out there. And uh, as you have said, people are looking. They are watching. They are seeing how you handle yourself, how you behave, how you are treating one another, how you are making time for one another as a couple, and how you prioritize one another as a couple. Let me welcome Pastor Teg. He's just joined us. Pastor Teg, Andre Teg, I hope you can hear me. Welcome. You must welcome, please. Uh, okay, his, his audio is not, um, is not activated. All right, quality time. So if there's one thing that you remember from here is quality time is quantity time. The more, the better. <laughs> we have a tragedy. If you look at um, the COVID-19 crisis, the judgment of the Lord with, of COVID, when, when COVID struck and people were told to stay at home, there was a big tra tragedy in that spouses have not known how to stay together for a whole 24 hours. <laughs> Spouses have not known how to spend 24 hours together. And as a result, divorce rates shot up, increased. Divorce rates increased this past year because now you have a people who are used to busy life, to busyness. They are used to being so busy, they don't have time for their spouses. And whenever they are together, and they have their conflicts, they never learned how to resolve their conflicts because, you know, a little conflict here, he runs away. A little conflict here, she runs away to go to work or whatever. Now they are forced to be at home with their, with their husbands and wives with mountains of issues that they have not learned to resolve. And COVID came, they're at home one month, two months, and they have Endless conflicts, probably, owing to all those issues they have never learned to solve. And a lot of divorces, especially apparently new, I think it's new, uh, new newlyweds. Lots of marriages were, de were destroyed just because people don't know how to spend time together. Husbands and wives don't know. A lot of them, they don't know. They can spend one hour at home. You can spend two hours, but then three hours, it feels like he's, he's, he's in a cage. He wants to go out. He wants to go somewhere. So if you can learn to spend a whole 24 hours with your, with your spouse, that will really do a great deal of good. <laughs> Amen. It will really do you a great deal of good, of good um, and growth, and growth in your marriage. All right. That is quality time. Quality time is quantity time. Nothing can beat that. You cannot replace it with anything else. And I think it is really, really important. If there's anything that you can begin with, it's always good to begin with quality time. And then uh, we go to words of affirmation. We have uh, 20 minutes left. Words of affirmation. You, you, uh, those are people, you still cannot see my screen. Eh? I'm really sorry. Nancy, Brenda, Ciele, Cecilian, Joki, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Of course, Sister Abby, welcome. Yes, it's good to have you here. Um, Pastor Teg, I hope you can hear me now. And then we have, uh, we have uh, words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation uh, have to deal with. Uh, wait, before I go to words of affirmation, um, Pastor Gael, uh, was your question answered? Was your question answered well? 
Yes, amen. Please sing a bishop. Amen. Uh, yes, it, things can, um, if you're not careful, we can easily become very busy, especially with ministry. Just when you think you have time and then this and that is calling for your attention and then if, but you have to prioritize. You have to be deliberate. Sometimes, sometimes especially when things become too much, sometimes you, you just have to say, I, I'm going to spend time with my family now. I will call these people later. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you just have to do it. Sometimes you just have to do it and say, uh, can I text, can I call you back after one hour? Yeah. Or please allow me to call you back tomorrow. Or whatever. You just have to try and um, make time for your family. Yes, if you don't do it, nobody else will do it for you. Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, these are words of encouragement. As we said, really, communication undergirds all these love languages. So you cannot do any of this without communication. Quality time, you have to communicate and set time together as a spouse. Words of affirmation, again, communication. Communication, communication. This time around, uh, words of encouragement, to encourage your wife, to encourage your husband, your spouse. Uh, words of uh, appreciation. Yeah? So with, with the words of affirmation, you're appreciating your, your spouse. You're deliberately, again, this is deliberate and purposeful. You have to deliberately do this. It's not something that just comes out while you're sleeping. And then your spouse, by chance, hears you dreaming about them. No, you have to say, I love you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I appreciate you. I thank God for you. Things like that. Thank you for ABCD. Thank you for the dinner. Thank you for the lunch. Thank you for um, taking the child to school. Thank you for, you know, for being home early. Yeah? You have to verbalize it. Yeah, so, so this is now being verbal, being vocal. Being vocal about your... Uh, your love for your spouse. So this is now being open. You know, the one thing I've noticed is when we have conflicts in our marriage, sometimes we become mute. <laughs> our conflicts, they threaten to mute us because you, sometimes we, we say nasty things to one another. We really hurt each other sometimes with our words. But um, you have to remember that um, you must always maintain good, you, you must have good words to speak to your spouse. Yeah? Irrespective of what your spouse has said yesterday during the conflict. Irrespective of what your, your, your husband has said. You must come back. You must come back to your senses and, 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 and fill your mouth with good words so that you are not a fault finder. Fault finder has nothing good to say but except to point out their faults. And indeed, when you look at your spouse, they look so different from the way, from, from the way, uh, especially newlyweds. They look so different from the way when you're in courtship. You realize that this is not the perfect angel that I thought this person was, yeah? That, uh, that does not uh, have any faults. You realize that this is a human being like you who needs to grow, uh, who needs to be pruned by the Lord, who needs to be corrected, yeah? And uh, who sometimes is wrong, just like you. And so that ideal picture that you had before marriage is really, then gets, a, you get a shock of your life. That this is not the person uh, that I thought he was. But it's not really that you thought he was, but it's your, it's, your, it's your perception that you had built about this person. Sometimes you don't have realistic, realistic perceptions. But, Having your conflicts, which makes sometimes it very difficult to say good words to your spouse, you have to take charge and find something appreciative about your spouse. And you must make it a habit. Make it a habit to appreciate your spouse. Trust me, you will not, you will not um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a spouse, if your spouse never appreciated you, and people outside are always 
saying to you, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Pastor. And, 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 and you, when you think of your spouse, you don't really hear them saying that. You, you feel sad. You feel bad. That why is my why are, is it only people outside who are saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Pastor Bishop, oh, you have blessed me so much. And your spouse is not saying that to you. It will, it will crush your heart. It does not matter how many thank you you get from outside. If your spouse does not learn to say thank you and appreciate you, it will crush your heart. But re reciprocate that now. Now imagine now it is you not saying thank you and all these nice words to your spouse. It will crush their heart. So you must learn to appreciate your spouse beginning from, you know, when you just wake up there. When your spouse makes the bed, you must learn to thank them for that. Amen. <laughs> Thank them for them making the bed. Thank them for cleaning the house. Thank them for whatever, for feeding the kids. Thank them for, for, for preparing breakfast. Thank them for their wise advice, their wise um, um, words of advice that they give you. Hmm? And also part of that is when, when your spouse speaks to you, don't be so quick to shut them down. Because if your spouse is speaking to you and you are quickly shutting them down, say, ah, that's not what I want to do. I want to do A, B, C, D. That makes them feel unappreciated. In our marriages, we should be free to express ourselves, to have our say, to advise one another, to correct one another, and, and to say all these, um, to have a say. We must be able to have a voice in our marriages. We must, not, we must not have the habit of crushing each other, whereby, which leads to the place where, as a wife or as a husband, before you say something to your, to your, to your spouse, you are, you are always scared that maybe if I say A, B, C, D, uh, he's going to lash out at me. But you must learn to listen. Listen to your spouse. Learn to listen to your spouse. And learn to appreciate when they say something. Yeah? If they say, oh, I've bought, I've bought juice for you in the fridge. Don't say, ah, who told you I needed juice? <laughs> yeah? You must rather find something better to say, oh, thank you so much for taking time to go and buy juice for me. It looks so small, but has... Huge consequences. Yeah? So you must learn to appreciate and be vocal about your appreciation. Don't say, he knows that I love him or she knows that I love her. Why, why should I say I love you all the time? <laughs> you have to. You should. You must. You must because that's what, that's what nourishes the marriage. Yeah? Your watering is like those, that, that, um, the kernel of water. You're, it's like watering your spouse. And you're encouraging them. You're giving them a boost to, uh, to continue to, to love you, to continue to also say that. And, and remember, the more you say kind words to your spouse, the more also they will say kind words back to you. Mm -hmm. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. And as the Bible says, uh, be slow to speak, slow to get angry, uh, and quick to listen. The same also applies here. And, uh, and as the scripture says also in the book of Colossians, I think it's Colossians, it says that let your mouth be seasoned with salt, be grace. Let your words be seasoned with grace. So uh, you, must be, uh, you must develop a habit of saying good words to your spouse. Right? Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this as if uh, these are love languages of giving, yeah? Although some, although uh, uh, the, uh, the love languages mainly focus on receiving, but if you really want to receive, if you want your spouse to be saying good words to you, to be one who uh, encourages you, to be one who appreciates you, to be one who's vocal about their love for you, you must you must set the trend. You must set the trend of saying loving and kind and merciful words to your spouse. If you don't do that, then uh, sometimes as human beings, whatever, whatever you sow is what you reap. If you're complaining, if you're always finger pointing and fault finding, why, why did you do this? Why did you cook chicken? I wanted fish. <laughs> you're not helping yourself there and you're not helping your spouse either. Yeah? If you don't eat fish because it makes you allergic, then you must find a better way to say it rather than just rebuking, 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 and shutting down. Hallelujah. Uh, and also another thing here is, try not to be a no ninja. 
no ninja. Do not be a no ninja. A no ninja is one who everything your spouse says is no. Everything the spouse says is no. I don't want. I don't want. Shall I get you this? No. Shall I do that? No. <laughs> Can we do this? No. Shall I bring you a cup of water? No. Would you like, would you like me to get you? The, no, 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 no. If you become a no ninja, you are shutting down your spouse. You are discouraging your spouse from doing good things for you. Now, of course, that touches on uh, acts of service, but it also has to do with, with the words of affirmation that when, when you learn to accept, when, when you learn to say yes to your spouse, it, or should I say, if you don't say yes to your spouse, then who are you going to say yes to? The people outside there. And it's also very frustrating, or it makes one feel unappreciated when your spouse is saying no, 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 no to you, but then they say yes to other people. That is very frustrating. And it's also, uh, it's, not, it's not a very good uh, act. So we should learn to, to develop a yes habit with our spouses. Uh, that also encourages them. That gives them a boost of encouragement. All right. And um, good. Anybody who wants to add anything to this, uh, to the words of affirmation? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I can say that uh, all these uh, words of an affirmation, it also uh, depends uh, on your culture and uh, where you live, things like this. Because from a culture where uh, we are coming from, some of us, the African culture, you know, this love, love, just saying I love you all the time, you know, it's not even in, in our mouth. So <laughs> it, yes. it all depends, you see. <laughs> like you see the uh, this I love you I love you all the time I love you you are not used to it and it's uh, mm -hmm. it's something even sometimes it's not easy to come out of uh, of our mouth you see so you can see how you can appreciate your spouse you see because yes. even uh, where we live like the white people you see the things they, they cherish like uh, receiving flower yes. huh? During, uh, you see them giving flower to their partners and people will be really happy and really, you see, it's too much happiness. But for yes. an African, somebody will bring you flower. You look <laughs> at the flower and you wonder, what, <laughs> what is this flower? What am I going to do with this flower? Yes. And at least they will have put this into money and given it to me. You see? Yes. So this, this one also, it depends on your culture and uh, really where you, you are brought up and, you know, the kind of things you appreciate. Yes. And I think you just look at uh, how you can appreciate the other person, like uh, what you say that uh, when someone does something, you appreciate, you say, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Yes. Yeah. But uh, you have to see what works also with you because some people will not begin to say, hey, I love you. I love you. For, it's too much for some people. That is what I want to say. Let us just get what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, and indeed, cultures, uh, as we have said before, our cultural backgrounds, our family backgrounds, does play a lot. Uh, does play a lot. Does shape our expectations a lot, uh, and shapes a lot of our uh, love languages. Yes, indeed, not everybody their love language is words of affirmation, uh, but for those that are, for those whose love language is words of affirmation, it means a whole. It means a whole lot. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, even though you may not be saying, I love you, I love you all the time, uh, and there are all these different ways. You need to be, we need to learn to be creative. Yes, that's it, that's it. We need to learn to be creative, uh, indeed, to learn to say thank you yeah, uh, to our spouses when they do good things uh, and being vocal about that appreciation. And also sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just also the words of encouragement that you are saying whether it's a, a thank God for you, um, you know, um, you are the best husband ever. Yes, you, you don't have to repeat yourself five times, three times, 10 times a day, but you find creative ways to show your appreciation, uh, show your affirmation, uh, and show your love for your spouse. Yes, that's, uh, that's very true what you said there. It doesn't have to be the, 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 the one word, uh, but try to find a very good, very good um, 
and creative way to do so. Amen. Um, our time is, uh, is run out. Uh, I think we can handle the other three uh, next time because we only have five minutes left. Uh, but as I said before, uh, as I said before, we have to remember that the five love languages, we, we need to have a, a certain level of balance. Yeah? For some spouses, for one, their love language may be quality time, meaning uh, quality time means more to them. Right? And words of affirmation may not mean so much to them, but still, you, you use, you, 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 you employ words of affirmation here and there uh, to show them that they are appreciated, and then focusing on that primary love language if it's quality time. If it's acts of service, receiving flowers or washing dishes or taking out the, 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 what, the dustbin or being with the kids while the, your wife is uh, recuperating. If it's that, then you, you put an emphasis on that. Put more emphasis on that and also not neglecting the others, not neglecting physical touch, not neglecting gifts, giving. There are some people who even, if, as, as you said, Senior Pastor Jacqueline, if you give them gifts like flowers or some other things, they're like, what is this? Yeah? This is not their love language. This is not their primary love language. It's not that they don't like gifts. It's just that not this kind of gifts. They, uh, and not maybe not so much. Uh, the, for them, maybe it's, uh, yes, maybe they would rather have money to buy something or they would rather um, have physical touch or they would rather have, uh, <laughs> have you do some tangible work for them or than, uh, than to give them flowers and books to read. <laughs> now, man, so we have to balance. How, <clears throat> find a good balance of the five love languages. Amen. Not neglecting the others, but putting an emphasis on the, on the love language that is primary. Okay. Um, as we finish up here, let me just go back to these questions raised by Shange Lao. By Shange about um, when we were discussing the, the topic of, uh, of divorce. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, the, the heart of men, according to what the Lord revealed, is that lacks faith, which is why we have divorce rates that is so high. It's where we have people breaking their covenants because of their lack of faith. Now, we didn't touch much on the issue of sexual immorality, and we really don't have time. But I'll just say this, that uh, of course, for us, our responsibility here is to ensure that we build our marriages and fill all the loopholes so that we don't give any room for the devil to give, to bring any temptation of immorality and all those things. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we divorce proof our marriages, we strengthen ourselves, we nourish our marriages, that we grow in the Lord, in our marriages, that the Lord is reflected and glorified in our marriages. That is our focus, that is our goal. Uh, so that we escape the snares of the enemy. Because the enemy wants to push people down the divorce road the divorce route, it said that half, half of, nearly half of all marriages, 45 to 50% of marriages are ending up in divorce. And for those that remarry after that, the, the rate is even higher. Six to seven out of, out of 10 people who remarry, they end up in divorce. And then about eight, 80% of those that have in their third marriages, they end up in divorce. And so the rate keeps only getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Divorce is not God's plan for us. It hurts everybody, hurts the wife, hurts the husband, hurts the children, hurts society, hurts the world, hurts everybody really. And there's nothing good in it. Um, and so if we will rely on the Lord and have faith in the Lord and follow God's plan for our marriages, then we are going to see a lot of good in our marriages and in our nations. Um, and uh, we will not have to worry about, uh, what about sexual immorality and all these things? And if you find yourself in such a situation where your spouse is uh, playing uh, games of immorality, remember, God has given us uh, the example to do our best to win our spouses back. Look at the way Christ came. Look at how Christ came. How God even now is, uh, is, 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 is still running after us despite our immorality and our adultery and all these things and idolatry. The Lord is still coming back. 
to, to bring us back home, that we may still worship him, that we may still be his children. Yeah? And as the church, that we may still be his bride. It says, I will not give up on you. Even though you have worshipped you know, other gods, I will still come and save you. So let us have that mindset. That mindset that uh, I want my marriage to work. I want it to glorify God. And uh, divorce shall not be our portion ever. Amen. So uh, I hope I have uh, answered your question, uh, Sister Shange. Uh, so we did not talk much on the issue of immorality. We were just talking about uh, the fact that faithlessness and lack of trust and the lack of fear of God is what is leading people to divorce and destroy their marriages. Is that clear? Shange. All right. You're most welcome. Thank you. Okay, as we wrap up, does anybody want to say something in these uh, last few minutes? Does anybody want to say something as we wrap up? Okay, yes, please, uh, Pastor Gail, you may pose your question. Amen, please, Senior Bishop. Amen. Yes, my, my question is uh, regarding the family planning matter. Yes. There have been some controversies mm -hmm. regarding the issue yeah. of contraception, and I wanted to hear from you what you have to say to, to this place uh, okay. in a biblical, with a biblical perspective. Amen. Uh, we have a booklet from Yaya Kidimani, uh, which if you look at the very last page, very last page of that booklet, uh, talks about uh, family planning. And the advice there is let each couple decide uh, according to their, um, let me find it okay, so that I don't bubble and entangle myself in words that are not. But the, 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 the core message there is that um, we have to decide as spouses according to our circumstances. According to our circumstances, and look at our situations. What are we able to afford? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you able to have children now or do you need to have children later? All these things are put into perspective and then uh, decide which one do you want to go for. Also with that is the question of what is, what, is, what is your medical condition? You know, there are a lot of things that affect the use of, um, uh, of contraception, contraceptive, contraceptions, yes. What is your medical condition? Uh, do you need your, uh, what is the doctor advising you based on your medical condition? Yeah. And uh, now if we are to go into the technicalities of the, of the, of um, the technicalities of, uh, Contraception, yes, you see that some contraceptions, like all the hormonal pills, all the hormonal methods, which is the majority, all the hormonal methods, which is the majority, they are, they are associated with the risk of pregnancy, about 10%. They are associated with the risk of blood clots, the blood clots that people are crying against uh, being caused by COVID-19 COVID and being caused by the vaccines. Those same type of blood clots are being caused by contraceptive pills and contraceptive methods, whether it's an IUD, whether it's um, a patch or injection or pills that are progesterone, estrogen, whatever. So they're all associated with that risk. And also the contraceptive methods, are there are abortifacients, meaning they abort the baby that has been formed but has not implanted. So, uh, and then you have, um, the, the barrier methods, yeah? The barrier methods that are neither hormonal, that are not hormonal. You have the IUD, which uses copper. Uh, the IUD works very well, has a high efficacy rate, but associated with strictures, strictures on the fallopian tube, which can also lead to infertility and ectopic pregnancy, unfortunately. And then you have uh, other barrier methods like the condoms, which can also burst and which um, can also lead to pregnancy and uh, all these things. 
And then you have uh, other methods like the uh, withdrawal method, which is really the most unreliable of them all. And then you have uh, counting days, which, uh, which brings into bear the fact that you need to be very self-controlled and be very, very patient and work together as a team for mutual understanding and um, charting the way forward, right? So, so you decide, what is your health condition? Some people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example, uh, they will need to use contraceptive pills, some women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, because it affects, because the condition affects their, their, their kidneys, not their kidneys, but their, their um, ovaries. The ovaries have a lot of cysts, and it affects their menstrual cycle, and they just need hormonal contraception to manage their con condition. So that they can have normal cycles monthly, uh, because if they don't, then their health is going to deteriorate. Right. So there are uh, all these issues. So what, which one do I do I do I advise? Uh, well, I advise the counting of days because uh, uh, which one aborts all the hormonal methods? All the hormonal methods are associated with abortion. Um, uh, which one? Do I, I advise? I advise the one that is um, more safe, secure. You're not, not, it's not associated with any self, with any uh, what's the word? Um, side effects, which is the natural method of uh, counting days. Um, yeah, that's the one I advise if you want my opinion. Otherwise, uh, the advice from uh, Yaya Kilimani is uh, you decide what's best for you. Now, does that answer the question, Pastor Gael? Or does it confuse you further? Amen, please. Is it clear, yeah? Amen. Amen, please, Bishop. Uh, the reason why I ask is because um, I heard in this ministry that uh, it's not allowed. So that's why I wanted to, to find out from a biblical point of view. But <laughs> you kind of answered it. Yes. Thank you so much. I mean, yes, there is the document. I can produce the document right here. Um, yes, uh, uh, Pastor Patricia, Overseer Patricia, you had your hand up, yeah? Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless the senior bishop and uh, all the wonderful married couple on the platform. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, I just wanted to contribute. Uh, based on what I've heard, uh, I, I apologize for joining late, just came from work. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, based on what I've heard, I would say that um, as married couples, we should uh, be very much sensitive. We should be very much careful um, to the complaint of your spouse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear your spouse complaining of, of something. Um, instead of instead of brushing it off, instead of overlooking it, instead of being uh, careless about it, I think that we should uh, take that complaint very seriously because within that complaint they might reveal their one of the love language, yeah. what they are really struggling from or what they are suffering from, what they are not getting. So they might bring it in another way, but then if you probe carefully into their complaint if you will take it very seriously and uh, really come to think about it it it, it might really like okay you might uh, recognize uh, their love language really so that is what i wanted to contribute as we build our marriages as we work hard to bring revival in our marriages amen amen thank you so much that's very true uh, when your spouse complains it's not a nothing complaint those complaints they reveal a lot very, very true. Pastor Jacqueline. Uh, I praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, I also uh, have a question. Yes, please. On this way of, uh, in this topic of, of divorce and separation. Yes. Because uh, <clears throat> there's one sister. So this sister, she's married and she's, uh, yeah, she, she's young still, she's married. And then at uh, a particular time, <laughs> this sister was uh, like uh, unfaithful to the husband, you see? Mm -hmm. That is before she was born again. Yes. 
now after being born again and receiving Jesus and she, you know, uh, she was told that, you know, you now you have to come clear and go to your partner and say everything. You see everything you used to do. Just make everything clear on the table. Mm-hmm. So this girl goes, uh, this uh, lady goes to the husband and says that, you know, we have been married like this, but she has been doing this, this and that. So when she tells the husband this matter, the husband now from that time onward, the husband loses interest in her completely. The husband does not touch this woman, this lady. The husband does not get close to her. And you see, <laughs> she's married and... Uh, she has the, you, have, you are young, you are married, you don't have a child, you don't have anything. So in this kind of setup, and the man has lost, lost interest in you like this. What, is, what can you give advice according to, to this story? Hmm? Amen. Because this, this girl is young, you know, she's in her 30s. She should also be thinking of getting children and things like this. But here is a case where the man now has rejected her completely. Is not no longer interested. They stay together. The man has no problem. He's providing food, drink, and clothes, and whatever. <laughs> Everything is okay. But yeah. the man has just <laughs> rejected her like this. Huh? Mm. Mm. So, so what can somebody do in this case? <laughs> Bearing in mind the issue of marriage, that uh, uh, divorce is uh, is out of question. Mm? Yes. And you have your future. You have your plans. You have to. You are thinking that before you reach menopause, you should have had kids and what have you. So, what do you advise in this in this um? In this context, mm. um, I I don't know who advised that uh, <laughs> that sister, but the right way to have advised that sister is number one. Uh, number one, such a, a a matter of an infidelity is a very very serious matter, and you cannot leave it, uh, and and. <laughs> You cannot allow just the, 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 the woman to tell the husband just like that. You need to advise on how to do it properly. There should be a proper way of doing it because it is to be expected that the man will be infuriated, especially if being very faithful to the wife. The, the other, it would be the same if it was um, probably the, the husband who was cheating. The, the wife could have been um, uh, offended in the same way. So the better way to have advised this woman was uh, to probably involve the pastor or the bishop in, in breaking this news. And this man needed to have his heart well prepared and well uh, advised on how to handle this matter before revealing such a bombshell. Uh, and it, now that this has already happened, the man is, is uh, uh, I mean, the news is already out. As they say, the cat is out of the head. They need help. Number one, the marriage has been built on the faulty foundation. So the first thing to do is restore this, uh, build, the, build the right foundation. That is the first priority of saving this marriage. The foundation has to be rebuilt. Two, you have to trust. The man finding out that the wife, that the wife has been cheating obviously will mean that he has been, the wife has been living a lie. So then the question is, what else has he lied to me about? Yeah, maybe there are more things. And, uh, and so, so trust has been broken and that trust needs to be rebuilt and it, and, and it cannot be rebuilt by the two of them. The, 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 the wife is not in a position to, to, to now preach to the husband, if, no matter how saved she is, she cannot preach to the husband because the husband sees somebody who has offended him. So the, we need a third party. We need somebody to come in. We need somebody to intervene and to disciple this couple to counsel this couple and to help them heal. There is a lot of damage done, a lot of damage, very, very uh, severe damage has been done there and they need serious counseling. That is the only way forward. Uh, uh, yeah, otherwise to do it by themselves, to tell what, what can the wife do? Well, the wife can do many things, can try to change as much as possible and ask for forgiveness and really humble herself. Yes. Uh, and so that the husband can see over time that this woman is really changing and she's really sorry and remorseful, but they need help. They need somebody to counsel them. That is, that is my, my, my advice. They need somebody to counsel them. The church, if they are going to church, both of them are going to church, then they need the church to be involved. Definitely. If the husband is not going to church, then 
the church has to, the wife has to work together with the pastor or the bishop to find a way to, 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 to convince him to come for counseling. That's, that's my uh, first take on it, Pastor Jackie. I don't know if that Amen. makes sense. Yes. The matters of unfaithfulness are very, 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 very hurtful. They are never to be taken lightly. Um, mm. And you always need uh, somebody superior, somebody who's very spiritually mature to help the couple with that, bringing out this truth. It's very, very, very shattering and devastating. Um, yeah. Uh, who else had a hand up? Was that? Who had a hand up? Somebody had a hand up. Uh, I don't know who it was. Uh, whether it was. Okay, Trees, Trees, Trisa, Abiambo, welcome. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, please. You're most welcome. Okay. And someone asked the same question. Please, please repeat again. I just want to, to say something about Pastor Gael's question. Yes. Yes, about the family planning. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had a, a Zoom meeting about uh, the couples with the senior Bishop Gero and someone asked the same question and he, he was answered that uh, in this ministry, they are not, uh, they, are, they never said that uh, uh, using the pills is the same, mm -hmm. but you can use it according to the doctor's uh, advice. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Is that is that all, Sister uh, Teresa? Thank Thank you so much for that clarification. In fact, here is the book. It's not from Yaya Kilimati Money, but from Nairobi Main Altar. Okay. Uh, probably you people still cannot see my 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 screen. Eh? But if you happen to see my screen, uh, you see there in the book from Nairobi Main Altar, there is the last section called Family Planning. There it reads Amen. the following. It reads the following. Wait, please can see it, please be sure. You can see? Oh, you still cannot see. Oh, we cannot see. Yes, okay. No, uh, that's the scene of the show. Okay, I'll read. I'll read it. It says, family planning, it is preserved for the couples. One, point two, it is influenced by many factors like family income, levels of education, career beliefs, reality, etc., etc. Number three, couples should, should be able to bring forth children they are able to provide for in terms of food, clothing, shelter, and good education. Amen. That is from the Marriage and Counseling Manual of 2016, produced by Nairobi Main Alta. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. This brings us to the end of our fellowship today. Uh, it was very good. I enjoyed our fellowship today. I hope it was, uh, uh, it was also helpful for you. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, Germany, joining us from the USA, Namibia, Bahrain, Kenya. Namibia, yes, Kenya, and uh, Linda Were. Are you in Uganda? So, thank you so much. Hallelujah. I'm in Kenya, please. Oh, in Kenya. Yes, please. You have a... I'm from Kenya, but... Uh, I'm from Kenya, but right now I'm in Saudi Arabia. All right. Thank you so much for joining us from Saudi. Yes, thank you. Amen. So, uh, I've joined late. I was requesting if I can get the audio, please. Yes, we'll share the audio. Uh, we have a WhatsApp. Thank you so much. 
Amen. We have a WhatsApp group. We also have a Telegram group. The Telegram group is called Christ Centered Marriage. Okay. If you search for it, you'll find it. And Telegram, uh, Amen. you can join. I'll put the audio there. I'll put the book there also that I was, that I was reading from. And what else? Yeah. And the video that I've been recording, I'll put it on uh, YouTube so that those who Amen. want to watch, Thank you so much. may watch. Amen. You're most welcome. Amen. All right. The Lord bless you, wonderful people. I'm going to ask Pastor, Pastor Jacqueline to pray for us, please, if you don't mind. Amen. So uh, we are going to pray now, blessed people. I just want to ask us to all of us to go into repentance, just to ask the Lord for mercy anywhere we have gone wrong in our marriages. Anywhere we have wronged the Lord, wronged our partners, if we have not given enough time to our, mar our, our spouses, our children, let us just ask the Lord for mercy. Amen. Even shortly before I conclude with prayer in Jesus' name, let us do that repentance. <coughs> Father Lord God of Israel, I come before you, Jehovah. Father Lord, I come in repentance because I've noticed, Jehovah, that I'm not right before you in my words, in my thoughts, and in my actions. I have wronged you, my Father. Oh, Lord God of Israel, please forgive me anywhere, Lord, that I did not treat my, part, my, my partner right, that I did not give him enough time, that I did not listen to him like I should, Jehovah. Father, Lord, I bring it in repentance. Please forgive me, oh, Lord. Father, Lord, help me to be a good partner, a good husband, a good wife, a good mother, and a good pastor, Jehovah. Oh, Father, I worship your holy name, and I give your name glory. And I do adore your holy name. Thanks for all these teachings that you've given us, Jehovah. Oh Lord, let them enter into the into the, the deeps of our hearts and change and correct us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Father, change all of us here in Jesus' name. I pray and believe. Amen. 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 So I'm going Amen. to pray now. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we want to bless you this evening for all these things that you've taught us, Jehovah. You are indeed a loving Father. We bless your holy name. We honor your holy name. We adore your holy name. We give your name glory, Jehovah. You are excellent. You are powerful. You are gracious. You are merciful, Jehovah. Thanks for these teachings. Thanks for what we have learned today, Jehovah. Thanks, mighty Father, for guiding us, for teaching us, for leading us to be good marriage partners, oh Lord. I worship your holy name once more in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, I pray thee that everything we have learned here, Father, Lord, remind us of them. That even in our marriages, we are going to put them into practice in the mighty name of Jesus. Where we did not give enough time to our partners. Father, help us now that we will allocate that time in the mighty name of Jesus. Where we did not give enough gifts. Where we did not give enough appreciation. Where we did not show patience and love to our partners. Where we were not submissive enough. Father, Lord, help us, O oh Lord, that we will change indeed. That we will change in our actions, Jehovah. Everything we have learned here. Father, remind us of them in our daily living, mighty Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, make our marriages better. Father, change our marriages. Father, Lord, with you in our marriages, I know that we will be perfect. We cannot do it without you. We welcome you, mighty Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, in our marriages. Come and take over. Come and lead us. Come and guide us. Come and direct our marriages. Come and bring your joy and your love in our marriages. Father, we don't know love. It is you that is love, Jesus. Come and pour that love into our marriages, oh Father, that our marriages will bear the fruits of love, the fruits that you want to see, oh Lord. Those characters, oh Lord, that you showed us, oh Jesus, the way you've loved the church, come and help us, that we will bring that love into our homes and marriages, that our spouses will feel that love, that our children will feel that love, that even that love, our neighbors will see it, and the churches, that we will spread it everywhere, that the light of Christ will continue to shine in us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we worship you, mighty Father. Even the people that are here and they are not married, Father Lord, I pray thee that they also 
you are going to guide them to choose oh lord the best uh, the better marriage partners that you created for them father you know where their ribs are i pray oh lord that you direct them and guide them that they will meet the people that you created for them to marry in the mighty name of jesus father we worship you one more time and even as we part oh lord let the spirit go with us continue to teach us and guide us in jesus mighty name we pray and believe amen hallelujah amen thank you so much pastor jacqueline very amen you are welcome prayer. amen amen very mighty indeed amen. i repent all the ways in which i have not my, loved my wife well amen uh, amen. amen i just want to say that i have shared the link to telegram if you look in the chat box um if you look in the chat box i've put the link to telegram so you may follow it and um join the telegram group the whatsapp group um you can send your number to that telegram group and then i'll add you on whatsapp amen and uh with that we have come to the end thank you so much pastor jacqueline and everybody uh, that contributed and that joined uh so blessed to have you today we will meet again in the next uh, three weeks which will be on a saturday uh that will be in um saturday the 5th saturday the 5th of june amen saturday the 5th of june we shall meet again and we shall continue with our topic hallelujah thank you so much the lord bless you amen shalom everyone amen shalom everybody